Hold on to your butt. <laughs> oh, hello. Welcome to episode 111, or shall I say episode 008 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. As always, I'm joined by Mary, a woman who is trying her best to let all of her emotions over- overwhelm her. I am merely the other New Englander in her life named Darren. Hello, Mary. Hi. How are you? It's a, a special intro. night. Wow. A special night, Mary. It's I'm so glad I, I asked you to do the intro, even though it was technically my turn because you did the intro for episode 110. Oh, yeah. I, I, I just figured the emotions would be so high that you couldn't even possibly get through it. So I'm happy to take one for the team. So how are you? What's going on? Oh, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing, I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking so, so much. I really appreciate that. So anyway, before we get on with these evening's festivities, Mary, I gotta, I'm going to be the host again, apparently, and ask you, what are you drinking on this fine, steamy Friday evening? I am drinking Green State Lager by Zero Gravity, which is out of Vermont, which is going to figure into our episode tonight. And I'm drinking it out of, shockingly, my Oliver Otis Howard mug. Oh, what a surprise. What, what a are surprise. you drinking, sir? Oh, thank you for asking. I, I didn't think you'd ask. I am drinking, it's called Conehead IPA. It's from Burlington, Vermont as well. I'm drinking it out of my mugs, O Generals, which happens to have Howard on them, because apparently that's, that's what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that. We are going to talk, Mary. We've put this off long enough. We have. We're going to finally talk about the enigmatic, enigmatic Oliver Otis Howard, a man who has seen his reputation go up and down, kind of like my 401k plan has. <laughs> and as we get deeper into the story, it tells a very, very interesting story about him. So I think I think he's a very interesting guy. He was a true progressive, even by today's standards. Yeah. But but it's someone who really was guided by a real strong religious moral compass, which sometimes got in trouble with his men for it. Yes, he did. Yeah, he was very religious, although he didn't, you know, he was born into, I, I guess you could say, like, what would have been the typical religious family of the time. But he doesn't actually find religion until he's in Tampa, Florida, um, after he's graduated from West Point, And we'll talk about that. But yeah, he's known as the Christian general. He's known as Old Prayer Book. He's known as Uh Oh Howard as well. He has a variety of nicknames. And as you said, his his reputation has kind of gone up and down over the years. And even now it is still, you know, you talk about him at Gettysburg and you still hear the how like, oh, the, the 11th Corps got totally routed just like they did at Chancellorsville. And nobody realizes, you know, all that he does not not just before the Civil War, but especially after Gettysburg, you know, his career in the Western theater, which we'll talk about. But also, like, he d- it doesn't stop there. The guy is, like, he's doing so much up until his death in 1909. Like, he is constantly go, 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 you know? Yeah, I mean, he, he has a Forrest Gump-like life where he just does everything. And, and is really everywhere. Suffer. He is. And we're going to get into the good, the bad, and the ugly with him. But as you know, as Mary, you know, says he's got a rigid, handsome face. He's got rock hard abs. Oh my God. Of with the one arm. Jeez. We are going to talk about the Christian general tonight, Mary. Oh, oh, Howard. Unbelievable. We are. We are. So real, real quick background on the fella. Okay. He was born November 8th, 1830 in the small woodsy village. Of As we Leeds, discovered. Maine. We have. At the home of his grandfather, a guy named Seth Howard. Mm-hmm. The Howard family was actually originally descended from the Pilgrims. Who arrived here in Plymouth and in, um, in, the, in the Mayflower Mary in 1620, right up the street? Yep, his right? great, 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 I don't know, great grandfather was an assistant to, to Miles Standish. And as you said, like his grandfather, Captain Seth Howard, was originally from this area, but he moves to Maine and he's living with um, the family, you know, and Howard is quite close to him. Um, Howard loses his dad at an early age, at the age of nine, his father passes away. So, and he said of that, when he died, the grief of my mother, the gloom of the household, and all the circumstances of the funeral, the first I'd ever witnessed, gave a new coloring to my thoughts and cast a shadow upon my young life. I began to feel the responsibility of being the eldest child in the little family, and my mother began to advise with me as if he, as if a friend. So, at the age of nine, like, you know, he's been going to school, he starts school when he's four, but at the age of nine, he seemingly has to become kind of the, like the man of the house, I guess you could say. And it's after that that his grandfather goes to live elsewhere. But um, his grandfather, um, Howard describes him next to his mother as being his favorite companion. And his grandfather actually fought in the Revolutionary War, which is pretty cool. Uh He served during the last part of it as a private. And he would tell Howard stories of the Redcoats. And Howard said, this prejudiced me fearfully against them. Some of the stories included the Tories who burned houses and killed people with little mercy or discrimination 
And he, he, Howard said his grandfather had um, friends from the revolution that would come and visit him. And one was a wounded lieutenant. And he, Howard said he was very kind to him and his grandfather. And Howard said he didn't understand half of the war stories, but he listened to them with keen interest and well remember the hearty fellowship. So he, he saw at an early age the camaraderie that goes with being in the army. And I think that kind of stuck with him because if you look at him throughout his life, he stays friends with Sherman. He stays friends with Slocum. He goes to the reunions. You know, um, he's still very active. He's active in the army until he retires wow. when he's 64. Right. And I kind of, you know, in researching this, I always wondered if that left, you know, this impression upon Howard and how he saw that life. But the other part that he saw from his grandfather was that Howard said he was never fully free of what happened to him during the Revolutionary War. And Howard said his grandfather would have was troubled by dreams and had disturbed sleep. And he he fought over again, as I well remember, in his night vision, sometimes with actual demonstration, his never forgotten battles. So Howard knows that dark side of war too. And he, I, I he, wonder he if he does. thought of that when he's going through the Civil War, that Howard has seen both sides of it. He's seen the camaraderie, but he also sees this dark side of what it, this scar it left upon his grandfather. Yeah, I mean, Howard, you know, just going back a little bit, he, he's the, the oldest of three children. You mentioned his parents, Eliza, his mother, and, uh, and Roland, his father. And, you know, the Howards, I mean, for the era, they were just, they were typical Maine farmers. They mm-hmm. roast cattle, they had they made apples, things like that. And, and there was a whole bunch of thing, things we, we talk about, too. And, you know, he talks about when he was young, that some he, a whole bunch of significant events that happened in his life. And one did occur before his father died mm-hmm. was when his father, Roland, had returned from a trip to, from New York City. And he returned with a young black boy. His name was Edward Johnson. And he would be a farmhand and he would live with the Howards uh, for really the next four years of his life. And, and really for the next four years, Otis and Edward, they became like BFFs. They were inseparable yeah. playmates. And so it really helped Howard kind of ingrain that that baseline of racial equity and equality. And it stayed with Otis for the rest of his life. And, yeah. You know, later later in life, Howard will write about it. He'll say, I've always believed it was provincial circumstance that I had that early experience with a black lad for relieved me from a feeling of prejudice, which would have hindered me from doing the, this work of the freedmen which was committed to my charge. So like most people, what happens when you're young stays with you. It's that foundation of your house that mm-hmm. builds. And that quote really is, is an interesting one because you can also see, because he wrote this later, the religious overtones of yes. almost everything he has talked you know, talking about the provincial circumstance. It was this, it was God's will. It was that ordained. He met, he met Edward yeah. Johnson. And, and so, for, you know, you mentioned before Otis Howard's, uh, his father's role is going to die on April 30th of 1840. And, and Howard is going to be nine years old, and, and he's going to end up um, kind of bouncing around. You mentioned his mother is going to get remarried to a guy named John Gilmore. And you seem and to have you, a pretty good relationship with him, too, which might, I well, don't know if that was common for the time, but Howard doesn't really have anything ill to say about him at all. Like, no, it seems like no. he just kind of... It was like, okay, my mom's remarried, but that was probably common practice too. You have to think like his mom is quite young when his father dies and she's already got a few kids. So it was common practice that they would get married again, you know? Yeah. You know, and you mentioned how Howard's starting school young. By the time he's at age 15 now, he's attending a school called Monmouth Academy, which is kind of a snooty little private school Mm -hmm. up, up there in Maine. And he's up every day at four in the morning. He's up until midnight at night. Uh, And he's going to be studying for the entrance exams because he wants to go to where? He wants to Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, as I wear this T-shirt today. Which is where another Mainer went to. It's a few of them. I don't know the one you're talking about. But his work is going to pay off, but he is going to find himself at Bowdoin. And he's going to be taking classes because what does he want to do? He wants to be a teacher. That's what he wants to do. Now, while at Bowdoin, you kind of hinted at it, he's going to be in the same dorm with a guy named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Yeah. Who was and much not, more religious than Howard at the time. At the time, he, and, you know, he uh, so good old Josh, and it wasn't the same room, but it was the same yeah. dorm building. So let's, let's just clarify. So Howard's going to graduate 1850, and his uncle John Otis is going to suggest what he should do is you should probably drop an application into the military academy. You should go to West yeah. Point. And Howard's going to later describe this as the turning point of his career. What's interesting about Howard is he looks back on his life almost like with a, 
like a 2020 hindsight and just points out the important events. And it's very, it's very unique when you read the memoirs, you read his stuff because he, he knows the big points and he yeah. talks about them. So it's, he's very easy to kind of gauge. After his Bowdoin graduation, Howard's going to be off to West Point in 1850 in August. And that's what we had enough. So when what's, what's neat about this one neat story about Howard is while he's on the train heading from Maine to West Point, He's going to be happen to be happy to be sitting next to a former alum of West Point who's a teacher named Edmund Kirby Smith. Mm -hmm. And Smith is going to be, he's a West Point graduate of 1845. Um, he was going, he was returning back to, to West Point to go back and teach math. Now, Smith is going to go on, as you know, to, to be a Confederate general mostly in the Trans-Mississippi. He'll be credited as the last Confederate general to surrender yep. when he surrenders his army on June 12, uh, June 2nd, 1865 in Galveston, Texas. So Howard and Smith, they become acquaintances. And by Howard's words, he helped this young cadet kind of assimilate to life at West Point. Howard's going to later say about this, about, about Kirby Smith. Captain Smith's kind warnings saved me from a good deal of annoyance and from some laughable mistakes that a candidate is sure to make unless he is befriended. And so it's, it's just interesting, um, you know, the, the connections he's made at West mm -hmm. Point. Uh, Howard's uh, cadet adjutant is a fellow Mainer named Seth Williams, yep. and he's going to be the future adjutant uh, Williams's of, of George McClellan, and they called Seth uh, they called Seth Williams the nicest man in the entire army. Nice. That's from every love. Everybody <laughs> loves Seth, right? But what's funny is one of Howard's closest friends during his time at West Point is a cadet from Patrick County, Virginia. His name is Jeb Stewart, man, yep. all people. And he, they say that, that Howard helped Stewart so much in school that Stewart may not have graduated if it wasn't for Oh, oh my Howard, God. Which is just kind of interesting with how these, how these parallels do. Well, it's funny. Like, you know, you were telling me recently you'd read a quote where it said Howard wasn't that intelligent. But meanwhile, he's like, you know, he eventually, you know, flash forward, he becomes a professor of mathematics at West Point. And he's, I think he's quite Your intelligent. Job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Another person he's friends with is uh, Stephen D. Lee as well. Yeah. I mean, these guys are looking quite a re, quite a class reunion down the road. With these oh guys, God, know? could you? He, he does get in trouble at West Point though over his. Um, basically, Howard is. I don't know if I want to call him an abolitionist at this early stage of his life, but he's definitely on the road to becoming one. And he speaks up for African Americans, and it gets him into some trouble. Now, Howard will tell everybody in his memoirs it's, it was an incident in the gymnasium, but no, it was a fight mm -hmm. that that happened. Yeah, I mean, what, what's going on at this time, the 1850s? This is when secession's bubbling. This yeah. is when, when, we, when we, we talk about the episode of secession. years ago, you've long forgotten. But we did an episode on secession, and we talked about the 1850s, everything that was going on. And it's tough because you're in a military college. You've got cadets from the north and the south, and this is all going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Howard, he, he was an abolitionist at that point. By mm -hmm. definition, at the time, yeah, he certainly yeah, was. Yeah. And, but so he's going to find himself, and the story you go into it, that's more details on that. He's going to be ostracized by some Southern cadets. One cadet who was very hostile to your boy, O.O. Mary, was a guy named Custis Lee. Yeah. Who, just so you know, happened to be the son of the school superintendent, Robert Edward Lee. Yeah. And he was, he was very hard on him. That animosity you mentioned boiled over one day. Howard is going to find himself in the school's hospital. And Howard, like you said, claims he got hurt in the gym, you know, working on those rock hard abs, probably oh twisted God. something, you know, but he, he's going to get hurt and Lee himself, Robert E. Lee is going to come visit him. He's going to, he's going to tell Lee, oh, I got hurt in the gym, whatever. But the real story came out years later, actually, February 6th of 1910. It's when the story came so out. So after Howard when, passed away. Yes. It was a story and it's called the Newark Sunday Call. That's the name of the newspaper report of what actually happened to Howard. Now, I'm going to clean up the language here because there might be some children listening. But according to the article, some Southern cadets were talking. One said, we treat N-words like cattle mm -hmm. and we kill them when we can. And Howard overheard this. And you can imagine, he responds, he responds, colored people have a right to live, sir. And the Southern cadet reacted by unceremoniously smashing a glass bottle over Howard's head, so, which they say is what sent him in the hospital. God. So the, Howard's the not the only just, one to get hit with something over the head at West right. Point. Oh, exactly. <laughs> but the thing about what's interesting, though, is what, what you look at the story, it tells two things. One, that he's going to be an abolitionist, and two, yep. he's not going to rat out these Southern guys who busted his head open. No. 
he tells Lee that he hurt himself in the gym. Yeah. He doesn't so name names. Uh, he doesn't name, he doesn't. like he talks about it in his memoirs about the ostracism, not about the incident, but about the fact that he had a good friend who after it came out that Howard's feelings towards African-Americans, you know, this person said to him, I can't speak to you anymore. And it wasn't until years later that they started speaking again. And Howard does not say who it is, doesn't say if it's Jeb Stewart. I suspect it might have been S.D. Lee. But again, like he never says the name of the person. And Howard does that quite a bit in his memoirs. He won't throw people under the bus. He just basically says, uh -huh. this is what happened. And it was a very prominent person. Basically, like, it's like, hmm, who was that? You know, and you're left to think, like, well, who was in his class? You know, well, we talked about that. You know, Howard is going to graduate high in his class, Mary. He's going to graduate, graduate fourth, fourth yep. in the entire class, in the class of 1854. And soon later, he's going to meet Anne, Elizabeth Ann Waite. Yep. And she's from South Livermore, Maine. And they're going to get married in 1855 on February 14th. Yep. Is that the day I think it is? Yep, Valentine's Day. I think it is, yeah. Yep. In Portland, Maine. And what, it's a cool story about his wedding. But I don't know if you know the story, Mary about this wedding night. He gets married and there's a reception. During this the reception, they're all drinking, having a good time. I don't know if Howard was, but they're all, they're dancing, they're doing the chicken dance, the macarena, the whole deal, right? He liked to dance. Right? If a fire breaks out oh, down yes. the street. And he ends and up having a, to help out. A, I think it's a theater. Yeah. He leaves his wife and leaves the wedding party to help put the fire out. Yeah. On his wedding, I don't know if people will be doing that. But... You know, when this is all over, he's going to be assigned now at the time to command the Kennebunk Arsenal in Augusta, Maine. And by now, that secession crisis is getting yep. hotter and hotter and hotter. His brother, Howard's brother, Hal, I'm Roland. He's going to join the, the New Republican Party, and he's going to be an outspoken abolitionist. He's going to be that guy. He's going to be very much on board with it. So Howard's career kind of bubbles along. It's not long that he's going to get new orders, and he is going to be shipped, sent south to Florida, like yeah. a lot of people from around here do in the wintertime. He, he's yeah. going to go to Florida. A lot of people do, can do that, too. And that's yeah. also where William Tecumseh Sherman was. I believe General George right. Henry Thomas was stationed down there as well for a right. little bit. And he's going to go help make peace with the Seminoles, mm -hmm. with the Seminole tribe down there. Now, by now, Otis and his wife Lizzie, as he called her, they have a young son named Guy. And Howard struggled to leave his family when he went to Florida to make peace with these Seminoles. And this, it's a job that's going to foreshadow some things later in Howard's career, yeah. right? But while he's in Florida, you know, something happens to Howard. He called an epiphany, called an awakening. I imagine it's the same experience you had when you first discovered the IPAs. It just, the <laughs> lights went on, God. right? But, but for whatever reason, I know you got a quote to describe it, but whatever reason, mm. um, May 30th, 1857, that's the date he, he says, well, all of Rodas Howard is going to find religion and it's going to change him forever. Mm -hmm. He became extremely devout, a regular at the Methodist church near his camp. And, and so and so you, you could talk about, I know you read that quote earlier about, about how he described it. Yeah, it, he said, it was the night of the last day of May 1857 when I had the feeling of sudden relief from the depression that I had long been upon, that had long been upon me. The joy of that night was so great that it would be difficult to attempt in any way to describe it. The next morning, everything appeared to me to be changed. The sky was brighter, the trees more beautiful, and the songs of the birds were never before so sweet to my ears. And this is kind of Howard's, he becomes evangel like what we would call evangelical Christian after this, and it stays with him throughout the rest of his life. And, you know, he's missing his family, and I think that religion got him through that and religion is what gets him through the war as well. And at this time in the U S there is kind of a re reawakening of religion of the evangelicalism. It's very becoming much more prominent and all that. But I think, you know, you look at someone like general grant who is stationed far away from his family. He describes himself as feeling depressed as well. I think Sherman went through the same thing. A lot of them did. And oh. Howard clearly was going through that. He's young. He's newly married. He has a son that he can't spend time with, and he describes himself as being depressed. And he find, finds religion, and it sticks with him, and it gets him through. He Right. He becomes very pious. Yes, to the point he does. Where to the point he's often, annoying. <laughs> he's Right. He's referred to insultingly as yeah. old prayer book. Yeah. He, he's... he's that's what he that's what he was so his brother roland i mentioned he was a very religious and very devout christian as well who quit his law practice to join the ministry and yeah. he had some civil war things later on with that but um so once otis had i don't want to say his conversion but whatever he whatever he had 
Roland, his brother, is going to begin to regularly mail him religious books to read, mm -hmm. which Otis couldn't stop. He just couldn't devour it. He just couldn't stop reading yeah. it. But besides religion, Howard maintained those abolitionist values as well. So one day he's in church in Florida, and, and there's an elderly black woman. And she's slowly walking up the aisle down towards the altar, but she's having a tough time. She's older. She's struggling to walk. Some of Howard's fellow officers are snickering. They're laughing at her. What does Howard do? He's going to get up and he's going to help her yeah. walk yeah. to. It reminds me a lot of the Robert Lee story about the girl who no one was dancing with her. And he went yeah. over there. And just, it reminds me a lot of that on, on this side. But um, so it, you can see at this young age, this combination of abolitionism and religion all yeah. kind of meshing all at the same time. Howard, Howard is going to vow off drinking at this point yeah. for the most part, which he just, which is rare among his peers. You know, some guys oh, big time. time. Yeah. Especially but, when we look at later in the civil war with who he's hanging out with, like with Carney and the parties that he had, he's good friends with him and he gets invited to the parties, even though yeah. he doesn't drink. They would do toasts. He would use water. Yeah, he always said that luck. water was, he said water is the only beverage fit for a soldier. That's what he would say. Yeah. And he'd say it to people. He's like, oh, they don't well, well, I think like I read but, one article where, and I think this is more true to who Howard was, is that he rarely drank. So oh, there might have been occasions where he did drink, but it was he rare. He may have, but right. He was some, very similar to another devout soldier, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, yep. Mary, who he didn't want to fight on Sundays. He, he, he said that it was to violate Sabbath weakens the soldier. Um, who come from our churches and our Sunday schools. So again, he's he's going down that road. As you can imagine, old prayer book was becoming difficult to be around by a lot of the people. Yes. And this is going to be a recurring theme as he goes through the army with this. Mm -hmm. After his adventures in Florida, he's going to return to West Point to become a math teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Now with this heavy religious attitude, and now they're at the peak of the secession crisis. Yeah. They're, they're right there now. And right? he's at so, West Point with somebody who's going to become a very good friend of friend of his and that's William J. Hardy and right. also at the same time Hardy is there living there with his family and Hardy has a young son and Howard is going to not only is Howard a math professor there but Howard also teaches math um, and helps Hardy's son with math as well. And Howard talks about January of 1861 this is following the election of Abraham Lincoln the guy with the hat we talked yep. about and, and South Carolina secession Howard talks about the shock he felt when William Hardy, the, the, the tactics instructor at West Point, who literally wrote the book on infantry tactics, yeah. the former commandant of cadets, abruptly resigned his commission and left. And the, the line had been crossed, and Howard knew it. He writes at this time, when right at this moment, men from the north and south looked anxiously into each other's faces. Such was the situation that we knew the Civil War, with its unknown horrors, was at hand. So this is nut cutting time now. This is this is getting yeah. real. Men were leaving school and returning to their home states, and Howard was no difference. He's going to write a letter to the main governor, a guy named Israel Washburn, and to offer his services. Mm -hmm. Washburn said, "Nope, I'm good. Yeah. No thanks." He he turned him down. Okay? It's funny Howard's doing this too because right before the Civil War, Howard was kind of, you know, thinking on joining the ministry, and Lizzie, his wife, was like, "Oh no, you don't." She didn't want him to at all. Um, yeah. And then the Civil War breaks out and he saw that as kind of his divine calling was he's like, well, I guess I'm meant to be a soldier and fight in the Civil War. And that changed his mind from joining the ministry. It did. You know, main uh, main speak, uh, House of Representatives, their speaker, a guy named James Blaine is the next guy Howard's going to reach out to and to offer his services. And, um, and he, Blaine is going to hook him up. He's going to arrange to give Howard his own regiment. Now, Howard at this time, you know, he was nervous because he probably felt what, what, what people call today imposter syndrome. Yeah. Like he was a West Pointer, had experience in Florida, but he, he wasn't sure he was the kind of guy who could lead men in war. Well, he didn't and look, could, he didn't really, he, I think he felt he didn't look the part because he was very thin. He wasn't very tall. And he also was described as having kind of a high pitched voice. So he wouldn't have exactly have that kind of commanding presence. Like, you know, someone like Sherman who stood nearly six feet, right. Would have in front of troops, whereas Howard is shorter, high pitched voice and kind of scrawny. Yeah. And well, I think he's more of his experience. I think he's yeah. like, can, can I do this? Right. Yeah. So you know what he's going to do? He's going to contact a former cadet, who, uh, the cadet commandant of West Point too, a guy named John Fulton Reynolds. He's going to mm -hmm. reach out to, to Reynolds 
and say, what should I do? And Reynolds simply says, accept it, Howard. Of course, accept it. So Reynolds, he's like, okay, YOLO, we're doing yeah. it now. So on May 29, 1861, um, almost the exact anniversary, he has his conversion, but yep. real, real close up. Oliver Otis Howard will become the commander of the 3rd Maine, and he's going to join his new regiment in Augusta, and he's still feeling kind of insecure. I talk a lot about a guy named Abner Small. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called The Road to Richmond. He's famous for being in the 16th Maine, but yep. at this point, he's a member of the 3rd Maine. And um, I mentioned a bunch of times, it's a must read, you've got to read it. It's probably the best firsthand accounts of anybody who's written who, in the war, in my opinion. And um, so for the most part, he he doesn't like Howard. No. He hates Howard so much he made Chris White blush. That's how much he can't stand Wow, Howard. that's saying he something. Just, he just doesn't <laughs> like him. So he's basically, he talks about this, he talks about meeting Howard for the first time and when he comes to Augusta to take over the third Maine. He says, he was a pale young man, taller than the governor and slender with earnest eyes, a high forehead and a per perfusion of a flowing mustache and a beard. He talked to us about his family and also about the Ten Commandments. That's not a way to make a good impression on somebody. <laughs> exactly. And so he, so he's like, okay. So Howard is also going to have his brother Charlie as a regimental clerk. Yeah. We'll talk about Charlie. Yeah, he and Charles are very close throughout their whole right. life. But I think there's like, there's like six years between them. Like, there's, there's a there's lot. A big but he's gap. always. He's, he seems to always have one of them around him, which is probably very helpful. Yeah. So June 5th, June 5th, Howard and his third Maine are going to leave Maine for Washington. And, they're gonna, and Otis talks about the crowds in New York City, the crowds in Boston. They would cheer wherever they went. Mm -hmm. Now, around, around this time, all the activities down at the old Pratt Street were going down in Baltimore. Yes. Okay. And so as the third Maine arrived near Baltimore, what does Howard do? He has them unload their weapons because yeah. they know what, what the, the scoop is. But he says, surprisingly, he says, the crowd cheered us. But he did notice that there was no American flags in the city. Yeah. He, he talked about that. He was pretty scared and, going, I think, into that, given what had happened. Like, reading that part in his memoirs, you can see he's like, oh, shit, what's going to happen to us? You know? He was. He does make it to Washington, makes it a camp. But his experience really showed. I mean, and this is, it is what it is. There was one time there was one of his men was mortally wounded mm -hmm. because he went to pick an apple out of a tree with his musket and he held the muzzle and it went off and oh my killed God. him. Um, they, that happened. Um, there was another time when Howard told the men to, uh, to discharge their muskets, unload them. So they all kind of fired into the sky and the yeah. bullets all rained into the, the camp of the second main's tents and no one got hurt, but the bullets all ripped up their camp. Oh my God. And, and what's funny was, is ironically, where Howard's camp was is a place called Meridian Hill yep. in Washington, which is not far from where Howard University is today. Yeah, that came later. So yep. it's just kind of, you know, it's kind yeah, of it taught he taught he mentions that at some point that he realized when he was founding Howard University, he was very close to where he had started his journey in the Civil War. Yeah, and so what you know, he's down there, and like a lot of his men, Howard gets sick. Mary, it's a very sad part of the show. He's yep. going to get cholera. Yeah, and. And he actually, he, he thinks he's going to die. I yeah, mean, he, he gets really sick. scared because he gets really sick. But he does recover. So he finds out uh, after he recovers, he comes out of the hospital bed, wherever he comes out of, to find out that somehow now on July 6th, 1861, he's now in charge of a brigade, not just a regiment. So he, he wakes up and finds himself in charge of a brigade. Howard's out commanding a brigade. Under the, the the command of the grumpy old fifty six year old Mexican war vet Samuel Heitzelman, yep, and this this consisted of his former third Maine, but also the fourth and fifth Maine and the second Vermont. When Howard took his brigade to Alexandria to drill for Heinzelman, the division commander was not impressed. Mary with O. O. Howard, no. Nope. Heinzelman said of Howard, Colonel, your men give promise for the future, but you are not well drilled. <laughs> A poor officer. With a uh, a poor officer with good looking men. That's what he told Howard. Ouch. Now remember too, Howard at this time is still going through that thing. Awkward I don't want to say it's inferior. So, so you're hearing this stuff now of, of your boss saying your men are good, but dude, you kind of suck. Yeah. You, you know you don't you don't drill well yourself. So it certainly would have reinforced Howard's insecurities, to say the least, as they're getting ready to go where off to Manassas now. For the, where they fight the Battle of First Bull Run. Yep. You know, July 21st, 1861, Mary, Oliver Otis Howard and his brigade find themselves in reserve. 
at the Battle of the First Bull Run, which got underway in Manassas, Virginia. Now, when the battle was raging, Howard's men were in reserve. They, they stayed back. Mm-hmm. Finally, General Irvin McDowell is going to order them to move forward. So Howard describes their movement. He says, we double quicked as men dropped blankets as they ran. Many fell and collapsed due to the heat and exhaustion. Yeah. So this is, this is going into the battle. Um, they noted the number of falling men and ambulances that they ran by. Howard is going to get to where he needs to go, which is going to be a ridge line called Shin Ridge. And he's going to set up two lines. He's going to have the first line, which consists of the second Vermont and the fourth Maine, and that the line behind them is going to be the third Maine and the fifth Maine. Now, they are going to move forward. We talked briefly about this before, and they're going to fall under shot and shell. This is the battle where Hiram Berry of the fourth Maine, you know, he's commanding. He grabs, leads yeah. the men with his own flag, and he, so there's a lot of stuff. He studied Chin Ridge. It's a cool battle. Abner Small. The guy who doesn't like Howard of the Third Maine, he writes of this attack. I can only recall we stood here and blazed away. The faces near me were inhuman. So they were getting they were getting ripped up, but they were fighting. But the assault was futile, though. It was a waste of time. Finally, Howard is gonna is gonna issue special order GTFO and they're <laughs> gonna fall and they're gonna fall back. Okay. It, it's gonna be another case of foreshadowing, though. Yep. Which is gonna this retreat's gonna turn into a rout. And George, uh, a guy named George Rollins, he's a 17-year-old private from the Third Maine. He's going to write about this retreat. Mm. Um, God grant I may never see the same thing again. Our retreat was confusion and turmoil. George Bucknell, the Fifth Maine, he writes, confusion and disorder seized us all at once. What does all of Rhodes Howard have to say about it? He writes, at first, our soldiers didn't move in a panicky manner, but steadily, according to his own will, his own their own sweet will so it's every man for himself is what, he, yeah. what he's saying yeah but the other thing that happens to oh sorry go ahead i was saying ironically one of the guys firing on howard while they're retreating is guess who edmund kirby smith yeah from west point so the, the guy he befriended back in the day when he was driving to west point yeah sam Hein sam heinzelman you can imagine what's going through his mind he's going to ride up to howard and he's, i guess heinzelman swearing he's flipping <laughs> out he's losing his mind and he's going to yell, you know, to Howard to keep get control of your men. So Howard's first experience leading men in battle was a complete disaster, as his men had to fall back first to their camp in Centerville and yeah. ultimately back to Alexandria. So he's having a tough time of it. In, yeah, at the he struggles, and this is also the battle where he said when he was going into it, he was scared, um, but then he remembered like kind of his faith in God or whatever. And he said after that, he was never scared going into battle. He kind of just trusted that whatever God had ordained for him was going to be, and that there was no point in being scared. He was, he gets back to camp. He's back to Alexandria and and that serious homesickness really kicks in. Yeah. He he misses family very, very much. You know, he's, he's writing letters to them. He's, uh, he's included to himself, to his wife, Lizzie. And now he has three kids. He's got guy, He's got Grace, and yep. he's got a baby named Jamie. Yep. He's writing them letters. He's drawing pictures in there. Yes, he draws he a picture said, of himself. He says he drew a picture of himself because he wanted his kids to not forget what he looked like. Yeah. It's kind of sad to think it about It is, that. and you can find the, the – I think the letters available in Bowdoin College's archi- archives. It's really right. funny. It's like, it's like him. He's drawing a picture of the camp, and then he's got, like, the kids, and then he's got a picture of Lizzie, and he wrote next, who is this? Like <laughs> – He's like he's got a great sense of humor. I'm like, who is this? It's mom. If you look at some of his later letters, he draws pictures of dogs. Yeah, he, he, he just yeah. And at the just, time, like does. there's the, the one letter you're referring to, um, you really see um, just kind of the the loving father that Howard is, how much he cares about his family, because he will close his letters to his kids with, and also say hi to Orestes for me. And Orestes was their family dog. And that always like kind of whenever I read that, it's like that always stuck with me. They, you know, he's saying like say hi to the dog for me too. He's a family guy with his values. You know, what's going to happen to Howard though? He's still going to be commanding a brigade, but he's going to get a new set of regiments. So yeah. um, this time with without guys from Maine, he's this time he's going to be commanding a brigade under George Silas Casey from Rhode Island. He'll lead the 45th and 61st New York, the 5th New Hampshire the 81st PA in the 4th Rhode Island. Now, Howard was glad. You know why he was glad? Because every regiment except the 5th under Edward Cross banned alcohol. Yeah. 
Cross being New Hampshire, you know, too many brewers out there. He wasn't gonna. He wasn't gonna. Pay. So then but Howard doesn't a, have to be that a hole that's like, well, you can't drink. I'm sorry. Howard is going to drill his men in front of in front of Silas Casey, and he rides up to, to, to the Rhode Islander. And to, like, what do you think? Casey's going to sigh and look at Howard and say, "What a fizzle." That's the quote he's going to use. Oh my god! So whatever, whatever the hell Howard's doing, drilling it. <laughs> right, right. I know. So, He's like, am I doing one, well? No. One man who was very happy to see to see Howard gone was the guy in the third main, Abner Small, yeah. who we talk about, who echoed the words of many of, of Howard's command when he said, Howard set us up as a brave example in battle, but his cold piety had wearied and repelled us all. That's what he yeah. said. So again, it's this religion thing that they're talking about. So whatever whatever's going on, it just wasn't sticking with the troops. And we we'll talk about this because when we get to the when we get down the road to the 11th Corps, it's it's more of an issue, right? Yeah. His men were often told that salvation waited for them on the other side, but they were worried about their skin on this side. That's that honestly what issue, I would be worried right? about too, religion yeah. or not. Like I'd be like, no, I care about what's happening about me right now. Give me a battle plan. Yeah, and this type of view took its toll on the men. It, it yeah. just did. Spring of 1862, Mary, General George McClellan, maybe you've heard of him. He was in charge at this point. He was in the middle of the Peninsula Campaign to capture the rebel capital of Richmond. And Howard's 1st Brigade, he's now under Israel Richardson's uh, division, um, Richardson's division in the in Ed, Edwin Sumner's 2nd Corps, mm-hmm. His brigade is now comprised of, of four regiments, the 4th Rhode Island's gone, he's, but he's got the other ones. So June 1st, 1862, it's going to be a sad day for, to, to talk about this for you, right? Yes, yeah. But, and ironically, it's a Sunday, which he said he never wanted to fight on Sundays. Yeah. This is going to be, of course, the Battle of Fair Oaks, Seven Pines if you're nasty. Or Eight right? Pines. Or Eight Pines, as we call it. <laughs> But as, as mentioned before, like Stonewall, he doesn't like to fight on the no. Sabbath. But this is a situation where he had no choice. He, he, he had, had no choice. He'll be riding with his brother Charlie ahead with the 61st New York. And Howard is going to be struck in the right elbow. The some reports say he was hit twice, but he was definitely hit, obviously. Yeah, once. the once was in the elbow. And then the other, I think, was I think the first time might have been the wrist. And then the next one was the elbow. Right. And he keeps riding and then he starts to get dizzy. And then finally someone is like, mm, I think we better get you to the back because I don't think you're doing very well. And then he he's good. finds yep. out he's got, hit. got to have his arm taken off. Right. So he'll be hit by a volley in the woods and he realizes he's hurt. He's going to turn over command of the brigade to Francis Swaggy Barlow. Yep. He's going to take him, take command at this point and he's going to go over to the back. Howard's at first going to be taken to a surgeon named Gabriel Grant. Who's going to look at the wound and kind of pass him on? Just he's going to send him to another surgeon by the name of Gideon Palmer from Gardner, Maine, which is not far, not far from where he was from. He tells Howard the arm has got to come off, and so Howard he'll be put under chloroform. And when he awoke, he's going to be an amputee. Yeah. And the next day, he'll be heading back to Fair Oaks train station, which is not far from today's Richmond Airport, if you know the area. Mm-hmm. And he's going to run into Phil Carney, Mary, who, who he is friends with. And, and he's, yeah. they they have an exchange, and Carney says, you know, kind of fair, paraphrasing, he's like, oh, don't worry, Howard, the women will still like you, even if you've got one arm. Because Phil Carney had, um, he'd lost, I believe it was his left arm. So right. then one of them said to the other, and I've read some stories where it's Carney, I've read some stories where it's Howard, one of them says to the other, well, at least we can shop for gloves together now. So it's kind of that, you know, your... like, less than 12 hours after losing his arm, he's like, well... I guess we can buy gloves together. His brother, yeah. Charlie has to go back to recover in Maine with him as well. Um, because he gets shot in the leg, but Howard recovers quite quickly and he's back by September of 1862 for the battle of Antietam, where he's going to be a division commander in the second Corps, And he's going to fight in the West woods. Um, he's actually back to second Manassas. He's, he's oh, there. that's right too. Yes. He's there kind of in, in he's, reserve. He's, he's kind of stands yeah. in the back and doing yeah. his thing, but you're right. He, he, he finds himself at the West woods in Antietam. Which after, is so isn't it after double day goes down? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's amazing how quick he recovers. Oh yeah. Think about it. Well, he wanted in, to get back. I think he went back to Maine and within a month he was like, I'm bored as hell. Like I want to go back, but it could have been, and, and, you know, the place of the amputation as well. Right. Like it right. all depends on where it happens. Howard, Howard is pretty well in Antietam, but I think 
you know, when, when you're talking about Howard and you're talking about his primary battles, most of it takes place in 1863. Yes. And so, so this is set the stage. Okay. February of 1863, um, but January actually fighting Joe Hooker, Massachusetts guy is in command of the army of the Potomac and he's going to completely reform it. Gone are those grand divisions and the army corps will be the primary infantry units. Yeah. Hooker, Hooker's going to play musical chairs with these corps commanders and he's going to, He's going to put Daniel Sickles in charge of the Third Corps, replacing George Stoneman. And this move is going to cause an issue with Howard. Because yes. why? Because, first of all, Dan Sickles is a political general. He's not educated at West Point. He's put in place, I think it's by Lincoln, but also Howard outranks Sickles. And Howard, you know, one of his things is he's kind of a proud man at times. And he's kind of like, whoa, wait, I've been fighting. Like, where's my... Where's my core? It's my turn. If Sickles gets one, so do I. Well, it just so happens well, he, that Fran Siegel he, has a little bit of right, a temper he does, tantrum. He does. He, he, the reason why is because it, it was by when you got your star. Yeah. Howard got Howard became a general, became a, got his star before Sickles. Yeah. And so he out and that's how they yeah, outranked that. And so he he outranked Sickles and he was pissed off. But to your point, here, he, another door is going to open up for him. Yeah, Siegel basically has a little bit of a temper tantrum. Brown Siegel's in charge of the 11th Corps, and he's like, I want more men. Otherwise, I'm going to resign. And Washington's like, Siegel's kind of a shit show. So they're like, okay, fine. You, we're not giving you more men. So he walks away for a while until Lincoln conveniently needs to bring him back for the 1864 election. Um, and anyway, Howard is offered command of the 11th Corps. Now, this is primarily... A, a German corps. A lot of them don't speak English. You have men commanding there. Um, uh, Carl Schurz is there. Shizignowski, Schimmelfenning, all guys that we're going to hear their names from. They're very familiar to anybody who studies the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, but the one thing about the Germans is they're very much, they're free thinking. They're not like the evangelical Christian that Howard is. And they also like their beer. I mean, well, who, that, who doesn't, thing. right? That's so Howard is in command of these guys that like to drink right. their beer. But the one thing that does happen is beer rations do happen to get cut in the AOP at this time. But these Germans right. blame Howard for it. So, like, things are not off to a great start for him being in charge of the 11th Corps. The, the 11th Corps is the Army's land of the misfit toys. Yeah, they're the red-headed ways. stepchild, you know, right. basically. You know, one in every four Union soldiers was from somewhere else. And, and a lot of them in this, were in this 11th Corps. Uh, and like I said before, the idea of a Bible thumping Mainer commanding who didn't speak German mm -hmm. commanding didn't sit well. One of the German soldiers said Howard cared more about our salvation than our morale. Yep. So he's, you could tell he's already started with the, with the religion thing. Howard did win many of them over, though. And this is one thing that doesn't get reported a lot about Howard, the, the progressiveness of Howard. Yeah. Howard was very supportive of Jewish soldiers, which is very rare at the time. And a lot of the German men happened to be Jewish. And, and so... It, he, you'd hear a lot about how he was with the, the, the black, the free men, but he was very he was very supportive of the Jewish soldiers as well, and that's the one thing that he did like about him for. But a lot of these guys, they wanted Carl Schurz to take command. Carl yeah. Schurz was an officer from Lablar, Prussia, which is which is Germany now. He fled Prussia in 1848. He had the reputation of being a good good soldier, good fighter. He respected him. He's a hard fighter, and he's the type of guy like you look at his picture. And he's either the type of guy that that can, like, screw you up, or he knows somebody that will screw you up. Like, oh, he he's got that perma something smells bad fit look on his face. Yeah, he's, he's just like look, angry right? man. But but Schurz had reservations, you know, um, about how the men would accept Howard, and and they said of them, they looked at him with dubious curiosity. Not a cheer could be started when he rode to the front. And I don't know whether he liked his own men. He commands it better than they liked him. So there's a feeling out process now. But this 11th Corps was a mismatch on many, many levels. Mm -hmm. Because for one, Howard replaced Siegel. That was a big deal. And to your point, this is an army. This is a corps with subordinate generals like Adolf von Steinwehr, Vladimir Shizanovsky, Al Alfred Schimmelfenig, Leopold von, Gil von Gilsa. Yeah. That's who he was. He had to control. So he's replacing a popular guy who, who was one of them with this guy who could not be could not be more different. Than, he's than, more, than... he's kind of the polar opposite. So he really has to work hard to win his men over. And I think for the most part, he eventually does. Like they bond through what they go through, right? 
Um, and he does, right. they, as we're going to see, he does stand up for them. They, right. But this is the point of, this is the state of affairs when Joseph Hooker is going to place Howard's 11th Corps at the far right flank of the Union Army in Chancellorsville in May of 1863. And the events of this battle are going to be Howard's absolute low point with the army. And it's one that he's still known for today, yeah. fairly or unfairly. And we're going to talk real quick about some of the details about the Battle of Chancellorsville. But a perfect example, and this is in history, it doesn't treat him, doesn't treat him well. Some do it, but a lot of them don't. There's a historian named Ezra Warner. He wrote a book called Generals in Blue. And he's he's he he talks about Howard. And this is what this is how he describes Howard's overall military career. His, his career must constitute one of the great paradoxes in American military history. No other, mil, no other officer entrusted with the field direction of troops has ever equaled Howard's record for surviving so many tactical errors of judgment and disregard of orders, emerging later not only with increased rank, but one with on more than one occasion with the thanks of Congress. So this, this is kind of where the whole thing kind of goes. Now, he's yeah. certainly not the only one, but a study into the details of May 2nd of 1863, it does leave you with a lot of questions that will probably never be answered. So if you look back real quick on the Battle of Chances, the morning of May 2nd of 1863, Hooker is going to arrive on the right flank, mm. and he's going to inspect the 11th Corps lines. He's going to say, how strong Hooker is going to say of Howard's defense on that flank? The flank was in the air, which means it wasn't anchored to anything. It wasn't yeah, to a river they, or mountain. They don't have was, anything was in, to fall back to. Right. There was, there was there was nothing. But Hooker comments how strong it is. Now, satisfied these lines were strong, Howard, what is he going to do? He's going to go to sleep. He's going to take a nap yeah. in, his, in his headquarters. And he's going to tell Carl Schurz, if there's any messages that come, just wake me up. But I'm, I'm going to crash for a while. Yeah. Because he don't, there's nothing wrong with it, but that's just what he was, what he was going to do, according to, according to Hooker now. And this is where it goes back and forth. He sends a message early in the afternoon saying to keep heavy reserves in hand in case the enemy attacks. And if he should throw himself upon your flank, examine the ground you will take in that event. So this quote is saying, keep the reserves. Now, it's important for later. So remember that, okay? Now, a little bit later, a second message is going to come from arrive for Howard from Hooker saying, the right of your line does not appear to be strong enough. No artificial defenses have been thrown up and there appears to be a scarcity of troops at that point we have good reason to believe the enemy is to your is to our right is moving to our right now here's what he said she said thing starts yeah. sure sure says he got those messages and brought them to howard howard says he never saw them right and he decided to strengthen the flank on his own on his own accord yeah. that's what howard's good says. for sure but sure sure notes the weak point is right on the right where Von Gilsa only has two regiments. Yeah, and Von Gilsa is saying Jackson's guys are coming here. And then Howard, Howard responds, well, then Von Gilsa is going to have to fight them. Yeah. That's what he says he said, right? But again, when the Rebs, they start moving, then there's 30,000 guys. They're marching with Stonewall. They're going to start to appear in that gap near Catherine's Furnace. Mm -hmm. Hooker is going to believe through words from guys like Dan Sickles that this is Lee retreating. But Schurz doesn't, he smells a rat. He disagrees. Schurz is going to ride over to a place called Dowdell's Tavern, which is where Howard was at the time. And he says, I think the Rebs are trying to flank us. Howard just is, is going to dismiss it because he's being told by senior senior leadership that they're retreating. Yeah. So he's just, he just, he says, Dilly, but Schurz was pissed off at hearing this and just by looking at his face, look at his picture. That's probably the look he gave him. Sure, is yeah. going to move three regiments in better position just in case an attack. And Howard seems to okay this. He's like, fine. But Sure says this is still an you can't defend this position. It's impossible because yeah. that many guys. Throw in one other thing. I mentioned the reserves earlier, right? Hooker is going to pull Francis Barlow's division away at this point. He's going to take them and to join Sickles. So now it contradicts that first message that Hooker had sent about the reserves, because now the reserves keep a strong reserve. Hooker himself takes Barlow away. Yeah. And so that's going to be the that's going to be the end of that. So what happens? 5, 5 p.m. on the 2nd, Stonewall is going to strike with his divisions of Robert Rhodes, A.P. Hill, and Raleigh Colston in those three long battle lines, 30,000 men spanning 12 miles of yep. road. You know, the 11th Corps is going to flee in pure chaos. Yep, they get routed. Von Gilsa is 
pretty much run over. Rumors of his division commander, Charles Devins, Massachusetts guy, was they said he was drunk at the time. <laughs> probably drink, tried drinking Sam Adams because he was from Charlestown. That's probably exactly <laughs> what he was doing. But they said, again, he was drunk at the time. Where's Howard? He ain't there. No. He's not there. He's with he's with Barlow with Sickles at this point. Yeah. He hears about the battle and says, what the heck's going on? He Howard looks, and all of a sudden he realizes that the 005K has begun, and they're all <laughs> running by him. And all the soldiers are taken off, and they're, they're running back. Howard said, the men came rushing back with all the fury of a wild hailstorm. Yeah. So he's going to try to reform his men. Um, it, it ain't going to happen. He tells a reporter, I wanted to die. It was the only time I ever weakened that way in my life, before or since. I saw death everywhere. I could find an excuse to go on the field. So but contrary to popular belief, though, Mary, the, not all the 11 Corps did run like hell. They didn't. Many, sta- many stayed and fought. A rebel uh, a brigade under a guy named Adolphus Bushback. He's in von Steinwehr's uh, division. He's going to fight, and he's going to slow that rebel onslaught. Yep. 12 Napoleon, actually six 12-pound Napoleons under the command of Hubert Dilger, the same guy who would kill Leonidas Polk a year later. He's able to drive back many of Jackson's men. For this, Dilger is going to get the Medal of Honor. So there are some pauses about this. Yeah, there is. There is like, you know, it is a bad moment for Howard, but he chooses to remember it in a very personal way because there is something that happens in his life. His wife, Elizabeth, gives birth to a boy on May the 3rd, 1863. And they're trying to come up with a name for the boy. And he writes Lizzie on May the 9th. My core is much abused, but I think in a high degree unjustly. And then he said, I want my son named after the most terrific battle I have ever witnessed. The Battle of Chancellorsville. And and thus you have his son, Chancellor, who they forever call Chansey. He's buried in the same cemetery as his father in Burlington and on his grave, it just says Chansey Howard. So that name stuck with him. So obviously that battle made a huge impact. He wanted it to remember it to the point of naming his child after it, which is, it, it's very cool. And also just, I don't know, that's, that's quite a story. It's something. It's like Jeter naming his kid Ortiz. Think about it. It kind of is. It is. And, you know, like finding out about that, you know, he's writing his wife saying like, my core is much abused, but I think in a, to a high, in a high degree unjustly, that's a May the 9th. So he's already seeing this reputation the 11th Corps is getting, but he's like, this is the most terrific battle I have ever witnessed. The Uh battle of Chancellorsville. Howard does note though, he does note the lack of Barlow's division when he writes his memoirs that we've read. And he wrote uh, while he was sitting in camp in Centerville, I did all which I could have done by a corps commander in the presence of that panic without its reserve and being outnumbered three to one. So, again, we've talked a lot about this. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to stop Jackson at that point. But no. I think it's I think it is there's, there's a lot more positives to go with the negatives that people think there are about this. But again, no matter how you spin it, it's a horrible, horrible day for Howard. Yeah. And he, he he's accumulating this track record. Of, of things, and the problem is at this point when we talk about the next battle he's involved in, even when he does things that are good, it, it, it's it's his, gonna be bad. His reputation is stuck, and the thing with Howard is, I mean, he's human. He has faults, obviously, and his one is he didn't like to admit when he was wrong. And Chancellorsville, for the rest of his life, even though his kid is named after the battle, is a tough thing for him to talk about because. But he does recognize that he was wrong. It is not a great moment for him. I'm not going to sit here. I mean, I love Howard, but I'm not going to sit here and defend him for him. He made his mistakes there. But the thing is, is we're going to see, especially in the Western theater, that he learned from those mistakes. Um, Mm -hmm. And like, yes, he's got this, you know, the next battle that we're going to talk about. And everybody knows about it. The Battle of Gettysburg. He is going into that battle with the ghosts of Chancellorsville following him and they're not just following him they're following the rest of the core commanders as well Sickles Meade or well Meade he's going to be the commander of the army Reynolds they all know what happened to Howard and I think they're all very well aware given the letter that Howard was written a letter by someone prominent in the army of the Potomac doesn't name him but basically says you need to get away from the 11th Corps because those men will always run 
and you need to seek a new command. We suspect he's writing to George Meade, but we don't know because he doesn't name the guy. But whoever it is told him to get away from it. But that also tells me that what happened to Howard, these guys are recognizing this could have happened to me too Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, a lot of it was wrong place, wrong time. It certainly was. So real quick, you know, following the heels of Chancellorsville, you know, there's going to be some changes. We'll talk real quickly about Hooker's going to replace by the 5th Corps commander, George Meade, as you just mentioned. And without going into too, too many details about Gettysburg, we're not going to go, go into this whole thing. He, he, he's going to end up in a situation where it's going to be something new again. So before the battle starts, we talk about June 30th, 1863. Howard will find himself um, reconnecting with another West Point commandant in uh, and, and John Reynolds at Moritz Tavern, which is about six miles from Gettysburg. Yep. And after being summoned from his headquarters at the Jesuit Girls College in Emmitsburg, Maryland, by Reynolds, Howard and his brother Charles are going to have a meeting with him. And when they left, Howard said that Reynolds seemed very depressed. Yeah. He just seemed he was down. The details of the meeting are an enigma, but Howard Howard's is very vague. Right. Howard's going to return back to his headquarters, get one hour of sleep, wake up, and then head into town. So whatever, to be a, you want to you want to have one of those fly on the wall moments. Be a fly on the wall at that meeting. I that, would, that 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 would that could probably explain so much of what happened at the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg is that being at yeah, that meeting. Yeah, I think there was three people that knew what happened at that meeting, and one of them was a person who wasn't there, Buford, but the other one was Reynolds. The other one was Howard, and Reynolds is gone July the first by. 10 30 in the morning Buford is gone December of 1863 Howard lives until 1909 and he never I don't think he ever talks about what happened in that meeting at all no, and that to no. me is one of the most that is one of my like you know top five if I could be a fly in the wall and witness that meeting I think we would have found out and had so many answers for what transpires on that first day of Gettysburg no, there's no question but that net, that first day at Gettysburg, Howard's plans were to have his divisions of Barlow, Von Steinler, and Schurz move into town, moving up the Emmitsburg Road. They get out their way, they get on their way in the morning of July 1st, and the, the battle it was raging west of town at this point. Howard will be riding in with his brother Charles, and they're going to get to the Peach Orchard. Eventually, they're going to get to Evergreen Cemetery, where they, they're going to find out as a message from Reynolds that the battle is underway. Howard is going to place his men on Cemetery Hill in the ridge surrounding it and told his adjutant, a guy named Theodore Meisenberg, this seems to be a good position. Meisenberg responds, General, this is the only, only position. position. Yeah, this is, so, this ha- is it. So, so Howard is going to defend the hills surrounding the town's cemetery. And this, is, this, this location is going to be the primary focus of the Battle of Gettysburg on July 1st. July 2nd and July 3rd. So Howard's decision to, to defend that is going to be a very decisive one, which will affect the rest of this battle. What's funny is many, some people who, again, this anti-Howard thing, tried to claim that it was Reynolds who picked the site. In that, But even a captain uh, in Reynolds' staff, a guy, a guy named Daniel Hall, he said, and he's quoted, General Reynolds gave no such order whatsoever to occupy Cemetery Hill, nor did he make any allusion to it. Abner Small, mm-hmm. he's back, Mary, he's back. The yeah. anti-Howard guy now in the 16th Maine. He's going to say, no, he wasn't even there at this point. He's going to say, General Howard's memory is conveniently defective. That's what he's going to say about Oh, my God. It. So, so again, you can see how all these things play into it. Yeah. Well, there's people... also um, that letter that Buford wrote, which th- we don't know what time he wrote it, but he wrote Meade at some point, and he basically said, things are in chaos, no one's in charge. You know, and at that point, Reynolds had been killed. So he's writing it by 1030 in the morning, maybe 11 o'clock. But I've seen it used in sources to kind of go against Howard and say that he wrote it by the time Howard had gone there and he was trying to throw Howard under the bus. There's no timestamp on that letter. I mean, so you have to interpret it how you will. But I mean, my own opinion, and I'm, I don't know if I'm right or, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. I think Buford wrote that letter after Reynolds had been killed, before he knew Howard was even in town and on the field. Well, that's certainly possible. That's, that's possible. my own opinion of it. And I'm not doing that to defend Howard, but I just think given the, the wording of Buford's letter, that he didn't know Howard was in town, because you have to think about it, Howard eventually directs Buford where to go. And I don't think mm-hmm. Buford would have written such a letter if he'd already had that direction from Howard. Yeah. Of course, the famous story about Howard at Gettysburg is how he learns of Reynolds' death. Howard's riding into town. He's heading into Mr. G's 
when an 18 year old, <laughs> when an 18 year old boy named Daniel Skelly shows him the roof to the Fonestock building uh, on Baltimore street. Yep. And that, cause there's an observation deck up there and he can go up there again, see the battle. So Howard goes up there and captain Daniel Hall, this is the guy who I quoted a few minutes ago from Reynolds captain, he shows up and he yells up from the street. Are you Howard? He's like, yeah. He goes, Reynolds is dead. You're in command of the field. Howard's like, oh, good. Howard probably, you know, he, he he's going to run back. He's going to send several messages to his subordinates. Uh, General Meade, he's back at his headquarters at the Shunk Farm in Tawnytown. And, and then he's going to go to Cemetery Hill. And you talk about, about Howard and about how his emotions are and how he was. Um, he didn't exactly wear his emotions on his sleeve, no pun intended, yeah. with this, okay? He he shuff, he did though he shuffled his corps and put Schur's in charge, while bumping up Schimmelfetting to take over Schur's position in charge of yeah. the division. Now he's going to meet with Carl Schur's. This is Howard now at the cemetery gatehouse, and he's going to go over everything. By all accounts, Howard was extremely frazzled to the point where he was swinging his sleeveless arm around. Oh, hours. He was stomping around. He was he was just having a full freak out situation i mean he's probably what he was probably he's 33 years old right yeah i mean he, he suddenly was like, placed in a situation where now he's in control of the whole army i know 32 Robert. years old yeah so so you can imagine Scherz is going to ride off and howard is going to go to east cemetery hill to help place his defense there's a story where he, he tells a flag bearer to go post the flag on a stone wall which is where the 1863 hotel is now mm -hmm. If with a park on this, it was one more field. And the flag bearer obviously didn't know who Howard was. And he tells him, I'll go if you come with me. Yeah, and Howard, like, yep. Howard's like, okay. And so he walks with him and he helps him plant the flag. And and then famously, you know, Winfield Scott Hancock's going to show up and he's going to show up with his orders. And we're not going to get into this whole thing. But when Hancock showed up, Howard objected. When Howard, when Hancock's like, I'm in charge. And he, because again, it goes back Dad to the likes rank. Me I, better. He goes, I have seniority. And yeah. Howard, but, and then Hancock's going to say, but I have orders. You'd like to see them. And Howard's going to say, no, you're you're an officer. I'm not, I'm going to trust you with your words. But again, they're going to hold that until General Slocum shows up, who's going to take control of the field until Meade yeah. gets there. But the story has taken on a life of its own. And our friend MJ, yeah. she did a presentation of that. It was very well done. She did such about a good this job. Uh, about this confrontation between the two. In, in reality, you know, Hancock did offer a sense of calm because when he got there, for the most part, he hadn't been in battle. He hadn't seen everything. No. He rode up. And so his natural, his his demeanor is going to be a little more calming. Um, Howard did write Meade about it and say he's going to write – Please inform me frankly if you disapprove of my conduct today. Well, so he's like, he's like, what the hell did I do wrong? Like, I don't blame him for that. I mean, my self esteem would be a little bit low too if I had my core routed at Chancellorsville, and then I find out, you know, the the guy Reynolds is dead, and I'm in charge on the field, and my reputation has taken a huge beating. I would probably be a little bit. I would have my own moment of freak out as well. And I think Howard is having a very human moment. And we have to remember that these guys are all human and they react in real time. Any okay. of us there, like are any of us, we can sit here and say like, oh, I would have been calm if I'd heard that. I mean, think of Howard leading up to this situation. I don't blame him for being frazzled one bit because I might have too, but I also understand why Hancock is able to ride in there and be a little bit calmer because he hasn't been through what Howard has. He hasn't, uh -huh. you know, he hasn't seen it all. And he doesn't have that kind of like that Chancellorsville thing hanging over him either. So well, I sure see why he was a calming presence to the troops. But if you read Rufus Dawes' diary, like Rufus Dawes says that both Howard and Hancock were very commanding, very calming on the field. Both of them. Yeah. The Eleventh Corps is going to get is going to be in shambles after this battle. I mean, only one corps, the, the, the First Corps, really had a higher percentage of casualties than the Eleventh. I mean, some regiments in the Eleventh Corps only had less than uh, two hundred men left. Some yep. regiments. After the battle, Howard's going to write to his wife, and you know he's going to say, "I wish we had more men who had more respect for the Lord." That's what he wrote. Um, <laughs> there must have been a lot the, of swearing going on. I'm uh, guessing could, a lot of f bombs imagine. getting dropped. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> but the, the thing about it, though, is, is this is when you're going to see another shuffling of the deck here with the 11th Corps. Yep. 
and, and, and this is going to piss off, again, a lot of German soldiers, right? A guy named George H. Gordon. He's going to take over the 1st Division of the 11th Corps, replacing Francis Barlow, who was injured. Mm-hmm. Um, Hector Tisdale is going to command the 1st Brigade under Schurz, replacing Schimmelfeng, who requested a change. He wanted to get the hell out of this, this theater. Yeah. He ended up over Well, in I don't blame oh, him oh, after oh. spending those time with the pigs, right? Like... He did. <laughs> but the news of this 11th Corps quotation fingers cowardice hit the newspaper yeah. after Gettysburg. And it was right around this time. And while this is all going on, the Union and Confederates are doing their thing around Chattanooga, Tennessee. This is all starting, right? Yeah. And the Union's going to need reinforcements. So this is going to be a classic change of scenery situation for Howard. So to that end, the 11th Corps is going to be split up by Meade in the, in the powers that be in Washington. Mm-hmm. The 1st Division is going to be sent to Charleston, South Carolina uh, on September 24th, 1863. All the second and third divisions are going to join the 12th Corps, and they were sent to Tennessee under the overall command of Joseph Hooker. If you mm-hmm. go to the monuments, on the cemetery or the 11th Corps monuments, you can literally see which regiments were because you can see where the battles they fought. Yep, and you can see it on the 12th Corps monuments too. The other exactly. thing, the other thing too that happens to Howard this time is he is named one of the victors of Gettysburg by Congress right. with Meade and Hooker. As yeah. well. And that too, we're not going to get into this too much, but that does not make Hancock's crowd very happy. And there is a bit of controversy that surrounds that as well. So Howard's having to deal with like all this kind of social stuff with the media as well as he's getting ready. You know, he's kind of in limbo for a while and he doesn't find out until September of 1863 that he is going to be transferred to the Western Theater because of what has happened to Rosecrans at Chickamauga. So what happens with this is Howard is called to Washington, D.C., and he meets Hooker for dinner at the Willard, Willard Hotel, and they go over the details. Like, I mean, and I, the two of them were not fond of each other. Like, let's face it, they're, they're polar opposites. Um, and Hooker's blaming Howard for what happened at Chancellorsville, all this other stuff. Um, but then Howard goes and has this meeting with President Lincoln. And in that meeting, they're talking about him going out, you know, west and all that. But Lincoln mentions Knoxville. And he says to Howard, they are loyal there. They are loyal. Um, And he really wants to get Knoxville. And Lincoln ends up giving Howard his mounted map, which was better for campaigning. And Lincoln just is like, here, I'll take yours. Um, And he says to Howard, yours will do for me. And Howard says to him, we must work in with Grant's plans as he has three armies, the Tennessee, the Cumberland, and the Ohio. And Howard said that Lincoln, Lincoln went with that. This is going to be the last time and probably the only time that Oliver Otis Howard will see Lincoln alive. Mm -hmm. And he does say of this, how he feels about the Western theater. I feel that I was sent out there for some wise and good purpose. And there's another thing that Lincoln says to Howard too. Make sure after the war, and I'm paraphrasing, make sure after the war you do something good for those people in the Cumberland and we'll get to that closer to the end of the episode but they have this meeting that sticks with howard as we're going to see but the journey is 1200 miles to bridgeport alabama and they arrive there on october the 4th they are 28 miles from chattanooga which is under siege by braxton bragg and the army of tennessee and on their journey out there to the western theater they travel by train there's a few men swept off the train because for some reason they're traveling on the roof and citizens of the town pass through and would also give the men whiskey. And Howard, he shuts this down pretty quickly because you've men drinking whiskey who are on the roofs of the train. That's not a good thing. Um, he said, after several fatal falls were reported, I succeeded in effecting by telegraph an arrangement with the town authorities where we were to stop even for a few minutes so that the liquor shops were closed during the passage of the trains. When we caught an eager vendor selling bottles one time, secretly, in spite of all precautions, we found it a good policy to give him a, a free ride for some distance and then permit him to walk back to his town. So they're like the guy selling whiskey and Howard's like, would you like a ride? And the guy's like, sure. And then they're like, they stop and they're like, okay, you can go home now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But Howard's going to make a name for himself in the West. We're mm-hmm. not talking too, too many. So he'll be at the Battle of Wahatchee we talked about. Yeah. Uh, and now that. And really, after James Burbs McPherson is going to be killed on July 22nd, 1864, this is going to create another opportunity. And Howard is going to be the right guy at the right time again. He's going to find himself being named commander of the Army of the Tennessee 
over the outrage Joseph Hooker, yeah. who wanted the gig for himself and who still probably blamed Howard for Chancellorsville, which you can only imagine. He blamed but, Howard for Chancellorsville right up until the end of his life to the point where Hooker was like, he was interviewed one time and he's like, I knew Jackson was coming. Oh yeah. No, you didn't, Howard, dude. Howard, Howard, Howard will have a success at Battle of Ezra Church not long after, it was right on July 28th, yeah. and right outside of Atlanta. But all this whole army is going to be transformed now. And just, you know, Howard's going to command the Army of the Tennessee. Blackjack Logan will take over that 15th Corps. David Stanley will take command of the 4th Corps to replace OO from moving yeah. up. And Alpheus Williams, the guy with the greatest beard in Civil War history, by the way, by the by, Mary, he will, he will basically take over Hooker as a commander of the 20th Corps. This is three days before Slocum's going to take over. So he's going to take it in just a couple of days. Yeah. Too bad it's not the Triple X Corps. Great, but but Sherman takes a shine to Howard. He does, and he said he's in Sherman in his memoirs. He writes of Howard, in General Howard, I found a polished and Christian gentleman exhibiting the highest and most chival chivalric chivalric said oh, that's a neat one traits of a soldier. So he likes him. He does, um, and you know, post Atlanta, there's going to be a new focus with Sherman. He's going to be taking a long walk to the beach. Yep. And he, he's going to ultimately end up using Howard again. So he, 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 I guess you go back to the historian quote we talked about where Howard seems to fall on himself and always seems to, he's like a cat with nine lives, right? Yeah. And again, he's going to find himself commanding the right wing um, of, of, of Sherman's March to the Sea with uh, Peter Osterhaus and Francis Blair, yeah. while, Henry, while Henry Slocum is going to take the left wing, the Army of Georgia. And Howard's later, well, later, I mean, Sherman's going to later say about Howard was the best general on the march to the sea. Yep. Yeah. Sherman had a lot of respect for Howard. And the thing with Howard, his career in the Western theater is something that doesn't get exa examined a lot. You know, you talk to a lot of people and it's like, well, what did he do after Gettysburg? He gets to go to the land of misfit toys, which is the, the Western theater. And he redeems himself and he shows he learns like him fighting at Ezra Church, you know, Howard comes up to or. Sherman comes up to Howard and says, uh, I don't think they're going to attack. And Howard's like, yeah, they are. And the entire time, Howard is really taking care to place his men to protect his flanks because of what happened at Chancellorsville, because the ground there, now you can't really see it now, but the ground at the time was very similar to what he had at Chancellorsville. And he recognized that and he learned from it. And sure enough, S.D. Lee attacks him. There was another point in the Atlanta campaign too, where Sherman was saying, ah, they're not going to attack. And Howard's like, yeah, they are. And the next thing you know, they open up, the Confederates open up the artillery and Sherman just says one thing to him. Well, Howard, you were right. He doesn't have a great day at Pickett's Mill, as we talked about in an, um, an episode a few weeks ago. But this friendship between Sherman and Howard lasts throughout their life. And they do have their ups and downs. Sherman doesn't agree with, as we're going to see, a lot of what Howard does in the Freedmen's Bureau. Sherman is not an abolitionist, as we all know. Um, Howard is. But the one thing that, that Sherman says of Howard is, he says, I believe Howard is a real Christian. My wife is very strict in her religious observances, and that is all very well. But Howard is different. He is something about him which I haven't, but which I wish I had. So yeah. even though Sherman is older than Howard, it's quite clear that he admires something in him. Um but Howard has had to go out to the Western Theater, and you think about it, he's got to prove himself. He probably feels he has to work that much harder than anybody else out there. And when he is offered the command of the Army of the Tennessee, he says to Sherman, this needs to go to Hooker. And Sherman's basically like, well, we don't want it to go to Hooker. <laughs> like, just take it. Just accept it. You know, and Howard also mentions Black Jack Logan, and, and Sherman is like, no. And Sherman defends his choice in his memoirs, saying Howard had that kind of, you know, the administrative background. But the other thing, too, is on the march to the sea, it's Wild West. How oh. Like, Sherman needs two guys that are soldiers, and that is Slocum and Howard, um, to be adults in the room. And, you know, they do the march to the sea. Um, Howard does very well in it, obviously. Um, he has his own thoughts on what happens with the left wing and Ebenezer Creek and all that, Uh it was probably by design that Howard is not with Jefferson C. Davis. Jefferson C. Davis did not like Howard. He always made a point of swearing quite a bit around him. <laughs> um, but the one thing that um, happens when they're the continuation of the March to the Sea, which is, you know, through the Carolinas campaign, is at Columbia. Sherman places Howard in charge of Columbia. And I do think it goes back to this kind of 
how Sherman admires Howard for his Christian ideals, how he's kind of that adult in the room. And Howard's account of Columbia is very, you know, he says, yeah, there was fires. We don't know who set them. But you know what? Our soldiers got drunk and they wreaked havoc. But there was also Union soldiers that weren't drunk and were helping out. So he kind of tells this, the both sides of the story to it. And when they have to leave Columbia, Howard leaves the citizens with, with 200 head of cattle. And he leaves them, with some, leaves them with some weapons because he's recognizing at this point the Civil War is coming to an end. And he realizes we have to start reconciling with these people. We have to make them our friends. Yep. So that we he, can, he you know, so that we can kind of carry on with that. And then you have Bentonville and the battle there and the surrender. Right. But the one thing that happens at the Battle of Bentonville is General Hardy's son is killed. And Howard finds out about it from a Confederate soldier that sends him a message and says his son was killed. And that, that death affected Howard, too, because Howard knew that boy. And that boy, odds are, was the same age as some of Howard's kids, too. Yeah, and he had, he had the history of the Hardy back at school, too. Yeah. Now, you, got, you mentioned before about how reconciliation and now was going to be reconstruction. Abraham Lincoln, obviously, at this point, was thinking about this, too. And he wants to think about how to provide for the rights of these African-American, these freed slaves. The 13th Amendment was going to be passed, but the issue of education and, and economic equality still hung over the country. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just was there. So to that end, Lincoln's going to pass um, – it's going to create the Bureau of Re Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. It's going to pass Congress on March 3rd, 1865. It will become to be known as the Freedmen's Bureau. Mm -hmm. Now – it was designed as a temporary agency that was only supposed to last one year after the war, and it would fall under the command of the War Department. The man Lincoln chose to run it was Oliver Otis Howard, yeah. a Christian general. And because he was so focused on equality for African Americans, he was a perfect fit for the job, especially since it was under the War Department. Yeah. But the role of the Freedmen's Bureau was to help former slaves assimilate into American society, right? To help find jobs, uh, income, to help them. Uh, get government representation. That's, in a nutshell, what it was. The job, Mary, was, is, was, to say the least, was difficult, right? Howard's got the, a difficult road ahead of him with this, um, but Lincoln naming him, you know, he's going to be head of the Freeman's Bureau from May of 1865 to July of 1874. And as you said, the, the purpose is to help integrate the freedmen. freedmen. And Howard's thoughts on the freedmen, the African-Americans, are this. They are among us. They are with us. They are of us. And they will no doubt continue with us to the end. So the sooner, so that the sooner we trample upon mere prejudice and folly, the better. So we have to treat them as equals. And that's kind of, that's how Howard saw it is, you know, he is this abolitionist general and he doesn't get called that very much at all, but he clearly is. And this is why Lincoln has chosen him for this role. And he's going to have a tough time with it. You know, Stanton is the one that calls him up to the Freedmen's Bureau. And it this happens on May the 10th, 1865, before the grand review of the armies even happens. And on May 12th, Howard will accept the position. And Sherman, his friend, and they are very close. They will remain close until Sherman's death in 1891. Sherman says to him, I hardly know whether to congratulate you or not. But of one thing you must rest assured, that you possess my entire confidence. And I cannot imagine that matters that involve the future of four million souls could be put in more charitable and more conscientious, ha conscientious hands. So far as men can do, I believe you will. But I fear you have Hercules' task. God has limited the power of man, and though in the kindness of your heart you will alleviate all the ills of humanity, it is not in your power to fulfill one-tenth part of the expectation of those who form the Bureau for Freedmen and Refugees in Abandoned Estates. It is simply impracticable. Yet you can and will do all the good one man may, and that is all you are called on as a man and Christian to do. And to that extent, count on me as a friend and fellow soldier for counsel and assistance. So Sherman is saying, dude, I don't think you're going to be able to fulfill this. And I think even Sherman sees the writing on the wall with how Johnson is going to be with this. But he's telling Howard, I will support you. So you ha he has the support. But, you know, even... Elizabeth Howard, on April the 15th, 1865, will write her husband, and um, paraphrasing the letter, but she says, Lincoln has been assassinated, and Johnson is now president, and now we are going to have a hard time. And I think she was referring to 
you know, the country in reconstruction because Johnson, I think, had a reputation at that point. But Elizabeth Howard obviously is, <laughs> she's an abolitionist too, you know, and she's recognizing what's going to happen. And as we all know that, like, Howard does struggle on the Freedmen's Bureau quite a bit. Of course bit. he does. I mean, Lincoln being shot was the worst thing could have happened to him. I mean, yeah. Johnson went out of his way to ruin it. I mean, he absolutely did. You know, you know when, when that... February of 1866, when Congress is going to is going to basically pass another bill to continue the funding for the Freedmen's Bureau, Johnson's going to veto it. It'll be it'll be uh, saying it's too expensive. It violates states' rights. Um, but Congress is going to over over uh, ride that veto. Yeah. But Johnson's going to keep fighting. He's going to start firing people that he feels are too sympathetic to blacks. He's all doing it to undermine the Freedmen's Bureau. Yeah. At its peak, it had 900 employees in the Freedmen's Bureau. Put into districts that were spread over left the eleven Confederate states. Yeah. Howard organized he, it like an army. He went in there and he was very like overwhelmed, and he was like, "Wait, I have to treat this like the military." And he made divisions, and he organizes yeah. it. Looks yeah. great on paper. But these these employees were consistently harassed by members in the South, by people in the, the, the KKK. KK. I mean, they. They, they, they tried to get land to give it to the former slaves, but most of the land was returned back to the original owners. For the most part, their efforts fell flat. It really, really did. Finally, in the summer of 1872, Congress is going to dismantle the Freedmen's Bureau. But there's one thing, though, that it did create that was really, really good and that Howard achieved, and that was the establishment of a school in Washington. Now, yeah. intended to be a the theological seminary for to educate black clergy. The school Howard founded on March 2nd of 1867 would go on to become Howard University. Mm -hmm. And within two years, it was a full university. Um, it's for within its first five years of existence, over a hundred over 150,000 freed slaves were educated, according to Howard, their website. But I mean, that's that's what it was. But again, it was a mission impossible for Howard, but it he was. was put in that situation. Sherman's letter to him was basically thoughts and prayers yeah that, that's what, i that's will what support you but you know yeah. howard you know one of the reasons that the freeman's bureau and howard being on it has such a bad reputation is because of fernando wood yes that guy in the lincoln movie that he is honestly my one of my favorite characters in it i love to hate fernando wood lee pace plays him brilliantly but he gets involved with totally slamming the freeman's bureau because um there was one guy on there um Charles, Reverend Dr. Charles Boynton, who was not an abolitionist, but basically said, like, African Americans can be members of churches with white people, but if there's an African American church, you better be part of that. So he's basically condoning segregation. Um, and Howard didn't really like that. And there were some newspaper articles that went back and forth. Long story short, the son of Boynton, General Henry Van Ness Boynton, gets Fernando Wood involved. And Fernando Wood starts saying, Howard is making himself rich off of funds for the Freeman Freeman's Bureau. And he will do everything in his power to block funding to the Freeman's Bureau. Keep in mind, Fernando Wood is a guy that wanted New York City to secede from the Union, make itself its own state and secede from the Union. And he wanted to get rid of all the DQs he, in Manhattan. He too. did, yes. And he did not want this to pass. This is really pure he, evil. <laughs> he did not want to pass you know? the 13th Amendment either, if you remember from the Lincoln movie. Brilliant oration in that movie. Um, but of this, Howard writes to his brother Roland, I've not always done right, even in bureau, bureau matters. In many things, I ought to have been more careful. In one or two matters that were presented to the other, to the investigation committee, there was an investigation committee that was formed twice to look at what Howard did. They exonerated me. I am not sure that I sufficiently scrutinized my motives. Had I been more rigid and exacting and stuck to the literal rendering of the laws, um, there might have been, you know, this might not have happened. But Howard does say that Balak, this one guy that is, um, being, you know, he's the guy the second time Wood comes at him was accused of embezzling funds. This ballot guy who was a commissioner, you know, Howard just says there wouldn't have been schools formed for African Americans. You know, we wouldn't have got this work done if he hadn't done this kind of like, if he hadn't done uh -huh. his, if Balak hadn't done the shady shit. But Wood called him out for it. And unfortunately, it, Fernando Wood is one of the reasons why the uh, Freedmen's Bureau doesn't have a great reputation. Yep, no, there's no question about it. So the Freedom's Bureau job is going to come to an end, and old Oliver Otis Howard is going to find himself doing what? He's going to be, he's he's going going to be go heading 
out he's going west. To go west, young man. He's going to be sent yep. out to Arizona to help negotiate the treaty with the Apache leader, Cochise. Yep. And he was successful in negotiating he the was. surrender. Cochise and- hugs him at the end and says goodbye to him. And I yeah. mean, the thing is, um, with Howard, he grew up hearing these really bad stories of Native Americans from his grandfather. And then his father bought him this, brought him this atlas, and that just kind of... So the bi- Howard is a he's a product of the biases of his time like a lot of us are today too right like we all have biases that we grew up with but the thing is is we can change our thoughts we can change our opinions on that and that's what Howard did and this is from um, a book that Howard wrote about his experiences with the Native Americans and he said my heart for years was steeled against such wild unmerciful savages who worse than Tories spared nobody not even women and children it took the broadening influence of years and the stories of William Penn and Pocahontas besides the persuasive charms of James Fenimore Cooper's novels to allay my strong prejudice and show me the equal or greater greater sinfulness of the Anglo-Saxon. So basically saying, guess what? Like the the white people, the Anglo-Saxon Saxons, they're doing bad stuff too. Mm-hmm. But the Native Americans are not what they're not the savages that they are portrayed to be is is what he's saying there so he's saying i've come around and i've changed my opinion yeah. towards them oh and he's going to do a good job october 12th of 1872 yeah. he'll get that negotiation he'll get that negotiation surrender a couple years later howard is going to be in the department of the columbia columbia he's going to be sent to fort vancouver in washington state to help fight the indian wars that were happening in idaho and montana primarily against the nez Perce tribe and one of their leaders, Chief Joseph. Yeah, now, and these are non-treaty well, Nez Perce. There was two different ones. Right. There was the treaty ones that signed the treaty, but then there was the ones with Chief Joseph that didn't um, yeah, sign the we're treaty. Not gonna talk, we're not going to talk in the whole thing with no. what's going on, but in, in a nutshell, they had a bunch of land. They got a lot of land taken away. Um, you had some people who voted for the treaty. Most of them didn't. There was the non-treaty Nez Perce versus the treaty Nez Perce. But at the end of the day, what, what happened was Joseph did surrender, um, he did have a famous quote, I will fight no more, never. Uh, and he's going to be the end of it. But it's an interesting bookend to the military career and the fighting career of Howard, because really he began with the Seminole Wars and he yep. ends it with the Indian Wars. So it was kind of a symmetrical bookend. Um, he is, he's going to go to New York City he's gonna, um, for a while over at Governor's Island before he finally does retire from the army in 1894. But before as, as that, he serves general. as superintendent of West Point from 1881 to right. 1882, which Sherman is not happy about that appointment. And Sherman writes Howard a letter that it re- like, Howard's like, dude, you hurt my feelings. Like what the hell? Like Sherman basically says, yeah. I don't think you were the guy for the job, but you know, Howard does a very nondescript time there. He tries to put more religion into it, which disappears after he leaves. But yeah, while he's in New York, um, Sherman is there and so is Slocum. And they have a social life together. Um, and one day Sherman went to visit, or Howard went to visit Sherman. And on Sherman's wall were each of his subordinates from the Western Theater, including Howard. And Sherman said to him, and thus we will leave them there when I will be summoned to the unknown. And Sherman passes away in 1891. I read one, one account where Howard was apparently at his house when he died. Um, but what we do know is Howard and Slocum are the ones that plan his funeral, his two wing commanders from the March to the Sea, and they will both be pallbearers at his mm-hmm. funeral as well. And New York is where he finished his career, his career in the Army. He retires at the age of 64 on November the 8th, as I think you had to at that time. You're not forced into retirement anymore, but back then you were. Um, but he does a lot after that. He, you know, leads like a very active life. And one of the things he does is he founds Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, Tennessee. And this it's chartered on February the 12th, 1897, which is Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And Howard was visiting the area at the time um, to tour the Chattanooga battlefields. But before that, he's going to go to Harrogate and he's going to give some lectures there. Now, the legend is, and I alluded to this story before, that when Lincoln and Howard met in 1863, before Howard goes to the Western Theater, Lincoln told Howard that he hoped he would do something one day for the people in that area. And Howard decides that what would be best is founding a university that is based on the values that Abraham Lincoln lived by in Howard's eyes. So together with some other guys, um, they 
buy this property that was supposed to be the Four Seasons Hotel, which was a British guy bought the property. He's like, I'm going to make a big resort here. And anyway, it doesn't happen. Um, But they found, so Howard, along with Reverend Myers, M.F. Overton, C.F. Eager, A.B. Keterson, M. Arthur, Lincoln Memorial University is founded. And today it still exists. They have an archives and they have a museum and um, like to give credit to them um, because we've been working with them to get some documents from them, from their archives. And they've been very, very helpful with that. So thank you to them for that. Um, Mm -hmm. They have an Oahu Howard collection, which is really cool. And for the rest of his life, Howard will raise funds for LMU, literally right up until the day he dies. Um, And he describes Mm -hmm. it as a labor of love. And he said, the continued success of this enterprise as a last work of an act of life, I greatly desire and earnestly pray for. No, he he did. He's he's going to retire. He's going to go back. He's going to move to Burlington, Vermont, to be near his oldest son, Guy, who was building Fort Ethan Allen at the time. Yeah. Um, Guy is also going to build a house for his parents, Otis and Eliza. They're going to be on Burlington Summit Street. Um, Howard is going to keep that office in town to do his work for LMU. And every single day, he will walk back and home to, to work at home yeah. uh, down down College Street. So he will walk, get up in the morning, walk to work, go to his office, and then walk back. Um, October 26, 1909, Mary, you know, Howard one day is me walking down College Street and he wasn't feeling very well. No. And, and instead of walking back, um, he's going to get a ride, something he'd never done before. No, he'd always walked. So what's going to happen? He goes back home. So just leading up prior to this, uh, five days prior to that, he had gone to on October the 22nd, um, 1909. He goes to London, Ontario, Canada, which is located an hour from my hometown. And he will give what is going to be his last public lecture. And it is going to be on the Battle of Gettysburg. On the Sunday, October, um, which would be October 24th, he will lecture at the YMCA in London, Ontario. After that, he comes home. And as you said, every day he walks to and from work. But on this day, October the 26th, He's not feeling very good in the morning, Um, but by the afternoon, he's feeling okay. He decides to go for his walk to his office, and then when he's walking back, he gets a ride home, and then he starts not feeling well, and then he goes upstairs to lay down, and some stories are that his wife, Elizabeth, found him. Some stories are that it was his daughter-in-law who was with him when he died. She was helping him get into bed, Um, but either way, Oliver Otis Howard passes away from a heart attack on October the 26th, 1909. And one thing he had said to his son, Harry, leading up to that, was someday my heart will just stop and I will be on the other shore. Yeah, and that that will happen. You know, his his funeral is going to take place at the First Congressional Church in Burlington, which is a a church he went to every single Sunday. And the services were conducted by a guy named Ernest Graham, who read a quote from the book of Timothy. And it said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. That's what he said. So a procession led by black U.S. uh, Calvary Buffalo soldiers will lead the uh, the procession from the church to the Lakeview Cemetery where Howard is buried. November 12th, 1932, Mary, a statue of Oliver Otis Howard will be unveiled at the Gettysburg National Military Park. Now, what's interesting about this story is when they were building when they were looking for a site to put the statue, um, two of Howard's granddaughters came to Gettysburg. Yeah, um, twins. And th- they were twins. And an elderly man guided them around the town toward gave them a tour of the town um, as they were looking for the site. The elderly man was Daniel Skelly, the eighteen-year-old boy who led Howard to the F- Fonestock House. Yeah, that's so. On cool. the day, of the first day of the battle. So now, years later, he's leading his grandsons, leading his granddaughters around to help find the, the site. So, yeah. um, and I, th- I think you know his story is a fascinating one. I think it's oh, one it that um, it, it's it's definitely depending on what you think of him, you can make a case either way. Yeah. He, he's definitely he's definitely a complicated fellow, uh, and I think he's somebody. Give him credit. He was he was, he was strong to his beliefs. He was strong to his faith. He was very progressive. He he was somebody who really felt what he was doing was right yeah i think but he was also the guy who just had that charlie brown in the football thing where he would just step in it and yeah he just he's did ned it. flanders and, of the civil war and he lead you know yeah. 
he's very well respected. I mean, 1900, he's going to celebrate his 17th, 70th birthday at the Wildorf Astoria. I think that's in New York City. And there's going to be a few speakers at the event. And one of those speakers is General Dan Sickles. When I found that um, at Bowdoin College is, is part of their all of their Howard collection, I was just I was like floored. I'm like I had no idea that is so cool. Um, and the you know the other thing, Elizabeth Howard, his wife, is going to pass away in 1911, uh, less than two years after Howard. She actually goes into poverty at one point, and kind of, I think she, the story is we have we're, we're researching it right now. That's one of the documents that we're looking for. Um, she has to kind of fight for a pension. Um, but she ends up having to sell some stuff because she's, you know, Howard doesn't, he's not very well off when he passes away. But on February 14th, 1905, they will celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. And Howard wrote in his memoirs, it's one of the, one of the, you know, kind of in the final pages of it. After many blessed years of married life, Mrs. Howard and I reached the crowning point, the 50th anniversary of her wedding on February the 14th, 1905. The golden wedding is permitted to a comparative few, so we were grateful to him who sustained us through our eventful life that we might celebrate the occasion together with so many of our family around. We held a reception in New York to our old friends came in our old to which old friends came in the afternoon, and thirty four brothers, sisters, children, grandchildren, and cousins dined together, all recording their names in the old family Bible, a wedding gift from Mrs. Howard's mother in eighteen fifty five. Amid the rejoicings of the happy event, we missed the familiar faces of those who preceded us to the heavenly home. And my brother Charles was the only one present who stood with us 50 years before when our life's achievements were still in the future. So Charles, the guy who is with him when he's shot, when he, you know, loses his arm and all that, is with him at his 50th wedding anniversary. And the two of them were obviously very close. But you can Mm -hmm. see from that quote that Howard, you know, there's things that go with him his faith in Christianity and God, the evangelicalism. Um, he's an abolitionist, obviously, and continues to grow in that as he, you know, goes through his life. And the other thing, too, is Native Americans. Yes, he carries the biases of his time with them, but he is more progressive than some towards them, uh-huh. I think. Well, he's he not is, perfect towards them. They're not treated very well. That's not what we're saying. But he is progressive compared to ones like, say, Sherman and Sheridan, how they treat them. Oh, there's no doubt. So Alvaro de Sauer is a guy who is, I think the story definitely needs to be told. I think he's somebody who is definitely fascinating. Yeah. So and I yes, he made be... his mistakes. He definitely he did. Certainly, Chancellorsville, he certainly, he Pickett's certainly Mill, did. not a great day. And he was a guy that did not like to admit when he was wrong. But who does? He's no, a he human. So. And he's a family man. He's a father. He's very loving husband and all that um he's obviously a friend to sherman and and many others as well but i'm glad we finally got to do this episode about him so thank you to everybody who listened to all this so mary (laughs) we made it to the episode you can go you can go shower down i'll take a cold shower and after talking about howard you can finally it actually is really warm in here (laughs) yeah that certainly is so what's coming up for us next what's next for us so we're probably going to get back to some battles in the next little while we'll be hopefully announcing our next round table and book club soon the dates for the rest of the year for that um you know we got a lot coming down the pipe with this for sure so episode 111 is in the books and we are on to 112 on to 112 111 all of Otis howard is done (laughs) so we'll be doing our live with this episode will drop in the morning so with this live tomorrow so book club is coming uh main at gettysburg is around the corner that we'll be talking about the date for that Round t- tables coming too. Don't forget, Mary, September 22nd, we are going to be at the National Civil yes. Museum up at Harrisburg. We are going to be, we, we have been um, in charge of doing trivia for the for the, the gang over there. So come by, check out their website, and hopefully we can come see you and you can come see us then. All right. Any final words from you, Fincheru? Well, thank you for humoring me, finally talking about Howard, and thank you to all our listeners and your support for these last 111 episodes. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you to everybody who was at our tour at Spangler um, that the Gettysburg Foundation, our friend Mark, gave on July the 1st um, mm-hmm. in Gettysburg. Just thank you for everything. So Definitely. I think that's it. All right. Off we go, everybody. Have a good weekend. Stay cool. We will look forward to seeing you all, as they say, on the other side. See you all later. Peace out. Bye.